Good morning. We're going to have a slight delay. Uh, orders of service are being printed as we speak. I believe I have one that uh, you guys can extract because I tend to give Emily my template, but I don't keep a list of what I'm going to do. <laughs> uh, so as we speak, I'm trying to at least try my pins here so I can at least attempt to get them easily. Uh, usually, the service may be a period. Uh, if we don't have any here, someone can bring some in perhaps and distribute them to the crowd. That would be lovely. Um, one moment here, so as I said, that I got uh, two people list of things, and I come in here and try to put on the markers and everything so I at least can find it immediately as we go along. Okay, I think I can find things as I need to. Um, so good morning, I'm John Dreesen. Uh, a doctor during the week, and I do experiments on the weekend. Uh, multifaceted, and hopefully, I'll do as well with one as the other. Uh, this is the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Cot Town. We are, I should actually say, it's the Universal Unitarian Fellowship of Cot Town, given the nature of my sermon, which is about universalism, which is kind of a small view, as I call it, in the UU world. And I'll explain why that's true. Um, we're a religious organization that emphasizes spirituality, we have only one creed, which is the inherent worth and dignity of all people. We accept you whether you're white, black, purple, gray, lesbian, uh, you know, alien, uh, we don't really care, as long as you believe that everyone is worthy of God's or your higher power's best wishes, you are welcome, and you will be in accord with our thinking process. So we welcome you today, and hope uh, what I say will be uh, helpful. In your spiritual growth. So the first, as always, will be the welcome and announcements. I've welcomed, and we'll see if we have any announcements for the fellowship. I know the last evening was the Halloween gathering. It seems like that tends to, I don't know, have a hangover effect on people. <laughs> Hi, I'm Linda, um, and I do want to announce that this is the first Sunday of the, as we move forward in the future, that we have an official RE teacher. Yeah. Megan um, has so kindly um, said yes to moving up from nursery to managing um, the RE. Uh, some of you may or may not know she's got a master's in education. She has thoroughly embraced um, the UU principles. Um, so she will be great in terms of helping our children on their journey uh, as they move forward through life. So I'm um, very excited to have her on board, um, which, need, which means we do have a board. We do need to hire somebody to manage the nursery. So if anybody knows anybody um, that would be willing to, um, for lack of a better term, it's babysitting. Um, and I don't mean to offend any small people here when I call it that, um, but it's more of attending versus teaching role. So if you know of anybody, please let me know. Um, I'm thrilled to see that we have many children here and um, we need to build out this robust. I see that your son is nominating you, just <laughs> Um <laughs> But uh, anyway, please let me know. And again, yay, Megan. So I'm Monica. Um, I am the committee chairperson for the Social Justice Committee. And um, I just wanted to read a statement from the UUA um, regarding the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza and Israel, just because I think it's current. And um, I'm also going to have these posted right outside on this bulletin board. So if you want to read further, but I'm just going to read the UUA statement. Um, the Unitarian Universalist Association joins the chorus of voices urging an immediate and total ceasefire, the admittance of humanitarian aid, and the restoration of power and water to Gaza to prevent the further staggering loss of human life that is inevitable under the current conditions. We support the call from the United Nations for the evacuation order to be rescinded, warning it, it will have devastating humanitarian consequences. We join a wide range of faith-based, non-governmental, and humanitarian organizations across the globe in condemning the government of Israel's ongoing bombardment, total siege, and forced displacement through the evacuation order 
of more than 1.1 million residents of Gaza in retaliation for Hamas atrocities October 7th attacks. We do so in line with our 2002 action of immediate witness toward peace and justice in the Middle East. To address the urgent humanitarian crisis in Israel and Gaza, and to prevent further ca catastrophic loss of the life of UUA, re, U, the UUA reiterates as a signatory of the October 12th Statement from Churches of Middle East Peace. I have a copy of that right here, which will also be out on the board. Um, we call for one, a ceasefire, ceasefire de-escalation and restraint by all sides. Two, all parties to abide by the laws of war, including the Geneva Conventions and customary international law. And three, prioritizing steps to secure the immediate release of hostages and ensure international protection for civilians. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna say too much more about it, but I just wanna let you know that I'm gonna keep things posted out there for like updated things that the UUA says, because I think it's really important for us to be aware of what our overarching UUA um, stands on these issues. So thank you. I would comment, by the way, that the Judiciary Universalist uh, Committee that is described over the course of time, even before the merger of the two phase, as they have their individual committees, has had a, an effect on the world far beyond the small nature, the small numbers of humanitarian and universalists. So it's a very worthy uh, and highly involved group of people. So if we can have our chalice letter, our excellence, do your job, we'd be thrilled. This is a reading from uh, Albert Schweiger, who, if not one of us, is in unity with our thinking. He was known to stay in the past. At times, our light, hang on, read Wesley. At times, our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another, another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who lighted the flame within us. May it be so at times when we need to reach out to others. So this is a time where we, uh, actually to quote Alan Quay, where we kind of switch from the humdrum of everyday life and the busyness that so challenges us as we try to focus on things in our life. We bring our chime to gather and turn off electronic devices to focus on being fully present here today to believe as the things do. In concert with the principal belief of universalism, which is God is love, love is God, and God loves and forgives all people, all of my hymns will circle around the idea of love. And we've heard them all before. They should be easy to sing. Uh, the first is hymn six, and please stand as you are willing and able.
Okay, so now is that time in our service, which is set aside for the younger people, hopefully to teach them as well the essential concepts with which we work in our faith, and is now time for all ages. And I'm not sure who is. Ah, uh, yes, Val is our. Wait till we get to read stories for me. <laughs> what was your yesterday, you guys? What was your last night? You got like costumes on, so I might not recognize you. <laughs> yeah, I'm this fan. It's fantastic. So you get another story from me. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm actually going to stand today because uh, I don't have slides for this book, but I'm going to do my best to kind of show the pictures because they're really beautiful. This was a story brought in by Ms. Megan. Uh, she will be doing an RE lesson to follow up on this theme of where people come from. And this story is called Where Are You From? by Yamil Syed Mendez. <laughs> where are you from? They ask. Is your mom from here? Is your dad from there? They ask. <laughs> I'm from here. From today, same as everyone else, I say. No, where are you really from? They insist. I ask Abuelo because he knows everything. And like me, he looks like he doesn't belong. It's a terrible way for a child to feel. Where am I from? Abuelo thinks. His eyes squint like he's looking inside his heart. You come from the Pampas, the open free land, he says. You're from the gaucho, brave and strong, from the brown river that cleanses and feeds the land, that gives us the grain for our bread, the milk from the cows. You're from mountains so high, it tickles Senor Cielo's belly. Does anyone here know what Cielo means? No. How about Senor? No? Cielo means sky. Senor Cielo means Mr. Sky. Can you imagine a mountain so tall that he tickles the sky's belly? Okay. Oh. Ah, where the condor roosts his family and the jaguar prowls the night. But you're also from the warm blue oceans the copper warriors tried to tame, and the elegant palm trees stretch their fingers to caress. Mm. What do you think that means, copper warriors? Mm -hmm. Ben, sorry. <laughs> what do you think that means, copper warriors? Knights? Maybe. I don't think they're talking about copper the metal. I think they're talking about copper of the color. The color. I think they're talking about the color first. Yeah. 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 You're from hurricanes and dark storms. And it's tiny singing frog that calls the island people home when the sun goes to sleep. From this land where our ancestors built a home for us even when they were in chains because of the color of their skin. You're from the grandmothers who search for their grandchildren, waiting, always waiting in a plaza, their white handkerchiefs wrapping the sorrow of their thoughts. You come from the sunshine that lights our path in this world and the rain that washes away and stays. But Abuelo, I ask, where am I really from? Abuelo laughs, you want a place? He points to his heart, you're from here. From my love and the love of all those before us. From those who dreamed of you because a song sung under the Southern Cross or the words in a book written under the light of the night star. You, you are from all of us.
I am. She says. And that is where she comes from. You can think all of all of us. All right. Those of you who are coming to the nursery are going to come with me. And those of you who are going to RE are going to go with Miss Megan. And is there more than it's just Chloe and Davey? Oh, oh, and right. Great. Thank you for listening. That's a great reading because again it circles back to the universalist concept of love and love for all. So it's now time for that section of our service where we will ask, as we always do, time, talent, and treasure. This is time where we ask for some of your hard-earned money and treasure. It does help to support the existence of this liberal congregation which we believe is a beacon for the Potts County area. So please give as you feel comfortable and able. <clears throat> So as I chose my readings, um, I chose the readings from three of the icons, if you will, the founders of American Universalism. Um, the first, actually I missed reading number one, so we're gonna catch up. And we'll talk about these, each of these individuals going forward, because they each have a seminal uh, place in, that's the problem of not wearing your reading glasses all the time, or between cataract surgery and glasses which are coming in a couple of weeks. So, uh, bear with me here because it's awkward just having reading lessons built in. So the first reading is from Theodore Parker, and we'll, again, we'll be talking about his significance as a founder, one of the principal founders of universalism in America going forward. His comment was, be ours a religion which, like sunshine, goes everywhere, its temple, all space, its shrine, the good heart, his creed, all truth, his ritual, works of love, his profession of faith, divine living. And I'm going to switch to the next major icon, uh, great story behind this man, which I will talk about shortly. Um, let's see, keep this here for the two readings that are back to back here. This is one which is John Murray, and again, interesting because Parker built the uh, sanctuary in which he gave his first sermons, but we'll come to that. This is John Murray, and another founder of our faith, the capital, of it, the small you. Go out into the highways and byways. Give the people something of your new vision. You may possess a small light, but uncover it. Let it shine. Use it in order to bring more light and understanding to the hearts and minds of men and women Give them not hell, but hope and courage. Reach the kindness and everlasting love of God. So moving ahead, um, I will give you reassurances. Many of you may be looking at the order of service and trembling because you're saying, uh-oh, sermon part one and sermon part two. And you're saying, what are we in for? Well, as you know, 
quoting uh, my good friend, Reverend Cheryl Meinstein, she had said that when she was talking, she had sermons, not to make them longer than about 15 minutes, which she was told was the time between commercials on TV, saying that that is about the finitude of human concentration today. So, so will be. I just realized I had two parts, which begin with the foundation of universalism in Europe, uh, and we'll talk about that, and the second half, which will be universalism in America, and I'll try to keep both of these a reasonable length, because I know how we all are, and I know how I'm a little twitchy when we kind of get much beyond 11.30. So, um, so bear with me, because uh, reading glasses, these are not perfect, but without them, you're all blurry. I can see what I'm doing here, and I think that would take precedence. So I've been uh, a member of this faith since I joined the faith in 1992 to the present. And over the course of time, I believe we have, again, as I said, the large U, which is the Unitarian, the Unitarian concept of humanism, and the small U, who are the universalists. Now, there's a reason behind that. At the time of the amalgamation of the two faiths, which finally occurred in 1961 after flirtation for most of the 20th century, the Unitarians were the much larger group, four times larger numerically than the universalists. They were basically, as I will come to, centered in New England and around Boston. There were the intellectuals, the wealthy Brahmin type of people. And our headquarters, of course, still is in Boston because at the time of the unification, they were the ones who got to dictate a little bit about that. But you had universalists who were one quarter strength. And they were more, mostly a world based religion. And we'll come to that as well. And the Unitarian message was a complexity of humanism, among other things. Universal's message, whether because of the people to whom it was being given, but also because of the theology, was very, very simple. That a living God would ever consign his children to a place of eternal damnation, which became known to all of us as hell. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. Now, as I contemplate the ser sermon, as I said, I felt we had a break with the two pieces, and I will try to do a reasonably non-boring job. I kind of came to a thought that Servants are either spiritual, let's say, you know, JD or Emily, or kind of more educational, which I tend to do because I think we need to know about our faith. Coming from the Jewish faith, a great deal of time is spent on understanding the history and the roots of uh, where the religion came from to understand where you were today. And I think we may be a little short on that, so I'm going to try to fill in a little bit. But I also realized that this was, I bit off a lot more than I could chew. So I'm going to be touching all things superficially on many parts of this. and. Hopefully, it will be intriguing to you, and we can revisit it later with maybe more directed sermons. So, my comment is that um, exegesis is the fancy term for doing research in the Bible, and I'll leave it at that. And what people found is that if you go back to Christ's early teachings and look at the Jeffersonian concept, because Jefferson was a deist and therefore kind of related to our origins, we're to deal with later. Uh, if you look at what Christ did and said, he really, if you don't look at Paul and all of his stuff, really he was into salvation. People were to come to him to go to what he kept said as his father or the eternal God. Uh, and actually my reading was that in the early couple of centuries after his crucifixion, there were six schools of theology of which four with retrospect, were all universal concepts that people would not go to a place of eternal damnation. And that was true for the first several centuries. There was a fellow named Origen, O-R-I-G-E-N, I believe, of Alexandria in the third century. He was a major exponent of that philosophy. So again, the concept of eternal damnation and hell hadn't happened yet. And I'm going to talk about where that came. But he felt that all creatures after a period of purification would return to the good will of God. He had the belief that all intelligent creatures were created with good and evil, but had a good free will, and again, would be restored to a relationship to God. He felt that God was wholly good and in injustice served no purpose other than bringing all people back to himself. I will also note, for the sake of other religions, that universalism was not unique to Christianity. It really pervaded a lot of religions over the course of time. However, in the fifth century, a fellow named Augustine came along, and he was really the proponent in his re review of the Bible, his interpretation, that hell should exist, and that's kind of where it seems to come from. Uh, he felt that it should be a doctrine 
and it was a doctrine of the church for a millennium after. Now, not much happened during the so-called Dark Ages. A lot of religion was in monasteries. It was being kept alive. The flames were being kindled by the monks as they continued to write and continue knowledge in a very cloistered location. So let's go ahead a thousand years. We come to two major figures who began the Reformation and began Protestant faith, of which we are a very distant relative, of course. The first was Martin Luther. Now, Martin Luther really didn't have a vicious concept of damnation. Unfortunately, he had a colleague, if you will, a person who was a contemporary, who was Johannes or John Calvin, of whom you may have heard a great deal. Calvin was the one who re-energized the concept of eternal damnation in a big way. And he was kind of brutal. He believed in the concept of what's called predestination. And this is quoted from Karen Armstrong, a nun who became a great theologian. So this is kind of her interpretation of what Calvin was thinking. Since God was all powerful, it was followed that man could contribute nothing, nothing towards his own salvation, that he that he, God, had decided from all eternity to save some, but predestine the many to eternal damnation. Wow. Lovely way to think that you really were screwed, basically. You, you were gonna be you're going to a very lousy place. There wasn't a whole lot you could do about that. Uh, you know, kind of a negative thought. Um, it's kind of funny because that was coming on the reason why Luther existed, right? Because people were paying priests to basically seek salvation. And that was why Luther invented his thesis. But here was someone who was kind of regressing, if you will, to an older concept. And so you can make no, you cannot change your faith. Basically, you couldn't do anything. You were kind of, as a minister in the past said in his sermon, you're in a cobweb hanging over the boiling oil. And that's kind of how you live your life because you really couldn't do much about it. Now think about that. Think about the power that that allowed the clergy to have over people in their thinking process of, you know, really, we may be able to help you a little bit, but I'm not sure how much we can do for you. So, not a good way to think. Now, then something happened, however, that was a breath of fresh air, which you can call the Renaissance or the Enlightenment, and that gave way to more enlightened doctrines and a newer view of this. But even the first universalists who were part of that were divided between the Restorationists who believe that in spite of universal salvation, people had to go through a brief cleansing period, called purgatory if you like, before they could be united with God in total harmony and unity. Now that gave way to a more liberal concept of, you know, saving was saving, you didn't have to be going through torture to get that way, but they felt that was part and parcel of their thinking process. Um, and the other people didn't believe that God would subject his people to any harsh measures to get to him. To, there were no hurdles to cross over. With some people were born, the very fact of your birth means that God loves you and you'll be saved and you'll be united to him. Now, the earliest concepts of universalism, universalism that I could find actually came from England. There was a fellow there named Relly, R-E-L-L-Y. And all these people, of course, came from another faith. Universal didn't exist as a faith. So he was a Methodist. And he had the assumption that there was a unity with all human beings, that Christ died for that unity, and his death was the assumption of all guilt and endurance of the punishment for people's sins and errors for the entire human race, and they would therefore be saved. Very, very different concept, and, and it you know, gets you into the whole thought that we don't deal with too much in our faith of how you heal the onion. What do you think of the Bible? What did you think it meant? These are all people looking at the same core, which is you know, the New Testament of some sort, all having these very different views. And so really, she was to look at things differently and went back to that early concept that Christ really was a savior of all. He was not being very selective if we go back to the very beginning. And we know a lot has been made, you know, today we have the religious right who chooses to look at the religion very differently than other parts of the Christian faith. So he was essentially the influencer of John Murray. We, we talked about him earlier, I'll come back to him. So there's kind of a lineage of people in England 
figuring out that universal salvation existed and they had reasonings based on biblical exegesis. And Murray was one of the people, there's another fellow I'll talk very little about called Elfano Winchester, known for the Winchester Profession, which you can look up, which was kind of brought to my attention in the first review of Berkshire County. And just a quick comment. So there were something like eight or nine universalist churches in Pennsylvania at the time of the amalgamation in 1961, of which that was one. It was called the Church of All Souls before 1961 when it was renamed in consistency with the current process. And so when I was a member there prior to coming here, there was a great deal of, of talk about universalism because the Pennsylvania Universalist Commission in the past still existed and they still were like a little fire of universalism and also spending a lot of nice money to the Universalist Church to help them with their budget. So I kind of got seeped a bit more than most people in the concept of universalism and how it led to our current faith. So that is basically, yep, that's part one. And that is a quick overview of kind of how we got from Christ to hell, to Calvin with more hell, to moving into universal salvation, which we'll talk about as it migrated to America with the various exponents that I'll talk about briefly. Again, a lot of research can be done about these people and where they came from but it was a multifactorial migration to America. And uh, we'll talk more about how powerful they were for a short time. So on that note, time for a bit more singing. This is hymn number 34. <laughs> So our next reading is from a man who probably was the most, maybe the most powerful force uh, a bit later on in history with regard to the formation of universalism in America. And we'll talk about him shortly. He probably wrote more uh, about it and wrote some of the principal documents that became the core documents of universalism in America. And that was Hosea Ballou. So that's number 705. If we agree in love, there is no disagreement that can do us any injury. But if we do not, no other agreement can do us any good. Let's endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bonds of peace. All right. 
we're going to break on to part two. Uh, you know, I've, I don't think I've ever done this or seen this done before, but as I was preparing my sermon, I kind of realized that there was just a great split in the middle here, and that was a great point to stop. So, universalism in, in this country, which obviously is directly pertinent to our existence today, there were multiple people who came over at different times bringing a message and good news of universal salvation. And remember that the earliest settlers in America were all Calvinists. Think of the Puritans in the colonies in, you know, who settled initially. They were pretty brutal in their belief. They came here you know, because they were Calvinists and they weren't doing well in the Reformation in Europe. And that's kind of why they came to Plymouth Rock. And that's also why, I guess it was Jonathan Edwards, founded Rhode Island, because he needed to get away from the very harsh beliefs of those people. It's well, why our state exists. William Penn is here because he was a Quaker. Society of Friends, and he believed that all people should have a place of refuge to come. So he too came here to escape that very harsh view of religion that was pervading parts of Europe. And this is part of what was called the Great First Revival. There was a second revival, I believe, around the time of the Civil War, but that was the fertile ground that these people found to till to do what they would do. Now, Here's a comment, and I'll come back to this. So there's still an issue between Unitarians who are also flourishing at the same time and the Universalists. Um, and this, of course, I think kept us apart for a very long time until we finally came to peace in 1961. So you may have heard of Thomas Starr King. His name is behind uh, at least one of our seminaries, the other being Lee Lombard, uh, the Starr King Seminary. And he made a comment about the difference between Universalists and Unitarians. And so you'll enjoy this. One feels they are too good to be damned forever. The other, give me a second, let me get this right. This is this problem with voice dictation, the way it comes out as, as alphabet soup at times. Yeah, but anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna box this. But he basically said that you know the one felt that they were too good to be damned, and the other felt that no one should be damned. So Basically, he, you know, tongue in cheek made a comment about the two different faiths. Sorry about that. I didn't realize how badly this was messed up. Um, but anyway, um, going on, there are several people who came to the States at different times, different places that began the faith. And the first one I'm going to talk about was George de Beneville. George de Beneville was initially, like many other people, uh, was an Anglican. And he was raised in a very harsh family. So he could not find peace in Europe and actually came to the Olde Valley. And the De Beneville house is still prominently labeled if you go down to 562. The first year you were in Reading when I was there was hoping to get enough money to actually purchase the house as a permanent you know, edifice in his honor. Never happened, but the house is still there and you can go, go by and look at it. it. It's interesting because when he came to America, he was practicing basic physician skills as an herbalist. He had his first services in the parlor of that house and brought the good word, if you will, to this area where it has flourished, I would say, ever since that time. Um, he went on to Philadelphia and, you know, continued to propagate the faith, if you will. And he said that, you know, self-discovery required experience to know about who you were, that there was no faith that dictated that, he felt that very much was an individual assessment of yourself. That's the first of the three. The second uh, was Thomas Potter. But Thomas Potter was an illiterate farmer in the coast of New Jersey. And he had a vision that about universalism, which he had determined on his own. And he went so far as to build a chapel, which uh, so he was in Good Luck, New Jersey, and great name. Um, and he built this chapel because he felt that somebody was going to come to be the minister in that chapel. Well, wouldn't you know, such a person appeared. And there was John Murray, who was trying to escape England, where he was basically being persecuted for his faith. And he basically threw his hands up and said, I'm not going to do this anymore. This is not worth my while. So the guy comes and Again, called divine will, if you will, his ship comes to a harbor near this uh, Mr. Potter's chapel and is becalmed because so that wasn't where he wanted to be. So he comes ashore and he talks to Potter 
And Potter says, you're the man I'm waiting for. You're the guy. He said, no, nah, nah, not me. I'm done with this. They made a deal that if the ship was to be calm for a certain number of days, it was a sign that he was to preach in the chapel. And as you would expect, that happened. He began preaching sermons in that chapel, which then led to what is called Murray Grove, which many of you may know about, which is a Unitarian Universalist refuge and camp on the shore of New Jersey, and is a retreat and still there today. And his chapel is still there in Murray as well. So Murray was quite a dynamic uh, speaker, and many people called him the founder, or a major founder of Universalism in America. But there was also a guy named Elhanna Winchester, who, as I mentioned, was first in America, went back to England, met people like Relly, came back to America, and was one of his inspirations, and was in Philadelphia, so he's another name you can keep in mind. And of all things, he was sharing his pulpit with Joseph Priestley. You may remember Priestley was chased out of England when they burned down his lab because of his religious beliefs, and he came to America to avoid death. And he was another major exponent of universalism, aside from his discovery of the uh, element oxygen, which may be more famous. And he eventually founded a universalist church, which I think is still in Northumberland, Pennsylvania, one of the eight or nine that I referred to before, that were part of the Universalist Convention in the state. And so they shared their pulpit there as well. Please note also that there are many people that we, as with Unitarians, that we would believe are believers in our faith, even if they didn't document so. So Benjamin Rush, of whom you may know in the Revolutionary Times, who is uh, Washington's priest, you know, chief physician to his army, signed with the Declaration of Independence and began the first concept of you know, humane penitentiaries for the time. He was also a universalist and was, if not converted, he was certainly in conflict with the concept of universalism. A lot of very well-known people, you know, it's fun to go back and Google uh, famous Unitarians or famous universalists. We are a kind of a non-proselytizing, humble faith. But if you do that, you become amazed, much like my Judaic roots, of how many very powerful and influential people were part of one of the two faiths, including universalism. Uh, you know, power beyond our roots, for whatever reason, uh, the spirituality dictated that. So the, the most famous person probably was Hosea Ballou, who in, converted to universalism in 1989, 1789. Now, typical of the faith, he was from the backwoods of Vermont and New Hampshire and eventually got to Boston. We'll talk about what happened when he got here. Um, and he was not a restorationist. He believed that you didn't have to go to the purgatory to get direct relationship to God. Remember, this is revolutionary, believing you could go directly to God and be saved without a time of cleansing or purgatory, or worse, even still, you never get there at all. So these were all very uh, influential and far-reaching thoughts. Now, the comment I had here was very interesting. So he ended up in Boston, and, and you may remember William, William L. L. V. Channing, one of the icons of the Unitarian piece of our faith, and he was, you know, as I said here, Jose Ballou, with his backwards accent and regular, no formal education, was no social match for Dr. William Ellery Channing and the other Harvard educated Unitarians, who, although they would make their way, oh, sorry, dominate the leading pulpits um, of the area, it was made up of humble folk, universalists, who, although they would make their way up the social economic ladder to relative prominence during this period of Ballou's ministry, were not entertained in those these homes of the best family who filled the pews of Unitarian churches. So you know, kind of, I just have to emphasize that although in time the religious beliefs became identical in many, many ways, and each were believing what the other believed, it was a rocky start. They were not accepted because they would be backwards folk. So let's see, what I have here. So I guess I can finish off with saying, in spite of these differences, in the century that followed became obvious, slowly but surely, to the Unitarians and the Universalists, that they were both running on parallel pathways, kind of doing what each other were doing. They both had very uh, active social interest groups, as we talked about, and they both were doing the same thing, often in the same place together, among many other things. They basically came to realize, after flirting with each other multiple times, trying to unify throughout 
the early and mid parts of the 20th century that in 1961, they finally came to an agreement that they were better together than apart. Um, so we have the amalgamation of the two faiths of which we are now the, uh, the bearers of that flag. I would point out also that uh, universalists began two major institutions that we forget about because like many that were begun with religion, they've become non-religious. The first was Tufts University, which was Tufts College. That was founded by universalists. And the early reincarnation of the California Institute of Technology, the name of which I didn't write down, was also founded by universalists on the West Coast and eventually became CIT and with his fame for mathematical excellence. So that's it. Um, I hope it's been educational, not too dry, not too boring, or at least I felt there's nothing else uh, we should be aware of that. We come from two pieces, the Unitarian piece, I think, you know, is very, very powerful. And as we, you are know, non-credal, I believe that we don't really think so much about being saved from a fate like hell, but that's where the Universalist came from. And it, if you look at the Universalist uh, dogmas from the past, they are actually encapsulated in some fair part in our seven principles. Uh, so they were not a trivial afterthought to the amalgamation of the two faiths. So keep that in mind, do more research. Uh, I was sort of scratching a great large bowl and gave it the surface and understand that, you know, we have a wonderful tradition of which we are a part of. So thank you for listening and we'll now Sermon. We'll do him 18, and then we'll do our sharing of joys and concerns in privacy. So please rise here as you're willing and able for him 18. time for a tradition which is practiced in all Chile. If you do us a favor of extinguishing the various bunnies, chalice, and others, and we have in our uh, order of service the reading for these things of the chalice, if you wish to join me for that. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of wisdom, the warmth of community, or the fire of the These are the barrier on the hearts, and our hands, until we are again. And the final uh, reading the benediction comes uh, actually comes from a minister who in the 30s was a minister at the first was in the Old Souls uh, Church in Reading, which became the first U, L. Griswold Williams. Uh, 
I kind of learned about it when I was there because he had three dominant face, piercing dark eyes, which kind of looked through you with a nice big goatee. Uh, and among his other things, he kind of was quite uh, an elocutioner, not I didn't uh, tell anybody, but he was an elocutioner. He spoke well, but apparently he used to pack the house. So there was quite a universal uh, power back in that time. He was just a very enrapturing sermonizer and we're told that really they would fill that old church down there in Reading. He also was a thespian and he was the one who began the Reading first Reading players, uh, which have been, continued today. But that, their first performances were in the stage that was removed, that was in the social area of that church, just historically speaking. So you'll appreciate this because he was a universalist minister in 471. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest of truth is sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell in peace, together in peace, to work, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve human need to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with God. We do believe in God or higher power. May it be so. Shalom, namaste, may it be. Thank you.